So, you're Elizabeth Bennett and you're about to be introduced to Mr. Darcy. You're gonna need to curtsy or bow to him, but exactly how do you do that? What is the proper technique? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about here in today's video. We're gonna be breaking down exactly what a woman's curtsy looked like throughout the 1800s, its evolution, its use. We're gonna be having tutorials on how to actually do this. And yeah, we're going super in depth on curtsying and bowing here today. So if you wanna learn all about that, then definitely stay tuned for today's video. So first up, let's talk a little bit about the history of curtsying in the 1800s. As we've talked about in other videos, the Regency and Victorian eras were still very hierarchical, respect-based cultures. Respecting other people was essential, and they worked many different ways to accomplish this into their everyday lives. And for women, one of those ways was by curtsying. Something interesting about the word curtsy is that it comes from the word courtesy. In fact, it used to be spelt exactly the same. And throughout the 1800s, it had a whole variety of spellings. In fact, we see some of these spellings in Jane Austen's books. But of course, we now have this spelling. I'm gonna magically make it appear on my hand in editing. Yep. Something else interesting about curtsying is that that term used to be gender neutral. Both men and women curtsied, but by the 1800s, curtsying was something women did. Men bowed. What's also interesting is women also bowed, and we're gonna be talking about the difference between a woman's curtsy and her bow in this video too. Now, when would you use this courtesy to show other people respect? Well, there were so many situations throughout the day that a woman would find herself curtsying or bowing. When she met someone, when she said goodbye to someone, when she entered the room, when she left the room, when someone else entered the room and she got introduced to them before dancing, after dancing, there were so many instances that a woman would be using this technique throughout her day. And there's also quite a few different ways that people in the era described this action. Of course, we have the word curtsy, we have the word bow, but we also have words like salute in relation to salutation since it was used to greet people. Also, it could be described as inclination because there's like an inclining of the body happening. I think phrases that pop up around the word curtsy are also kind of funny because someone could literally make a curtsy. That was a phrase like, oh, she came in and made a curtsy, right? But you could also drop a curtsy. It's like, yeah, I dropped a curtsy. <laughs> And there was the concept of bobbing a curtsy because if you really look at certain curtsying forms, there's like really a bobbing action happening. So someone could also bob a curtsy. So you could make a curtsy, drop a curtsy, and bob a curtsy. Mm -hmm. So now that we've established those basics, let's dive into the real question here, which is how would have Elizabeth had curtsied to Mr. Darcy and how can we do that ourselves? And the answer is, we don't know, but we can guess. So we can't really be certain what Elizabeth's curtsy would have actually been like for several different reasons. One, most obviously, is we do not have film recordings of young ladies in that era when Pride and Prejudice came out curtsying because film had not been invented yet. And because of that, there's like kind of a gap in the knowledge of the history of movement, I guess it would be called, because we can't be certain exactly what that would have been like through an entire motion. The second reason we can't be certain what Elizabeth's curtsy would have looked like is because there were so, so many different factors that influenced what it could have been. For example, her location, where she grew up, who her dancing master was, her age, and also, how fashionable was she? Was she from the town? Was she from the country? Of course, we know she was from the country, but like for any individual woman in the era, there were so many different factors weighing in that influenced it. Because there were fashionable curtsies that came in and out of fashion in London. There were dance masters coming up with the newest moves for their students. One thing I did see repeatedly throughout literature from the time period is the fact that older generations were like, Wow, they're doing curtsy so different now. Or fashion magazines are like, 
well, now this is in fashion, curtsying wise. Now, one of those big factors that would have affected someone's curtsy was their social position and standing. The trend throughout the 1800s was for women's curtsies to become closer to bows. It was known that curtsying had gone out of fashion by the late 1800s. And the only people who did curtsy anymore were maids or the socially inferior to their superiors. Now, curtsying was still around in the early 1800s, but even then it was losing fashion and women's bowing was coming more to the forefront. Basically, there were so many different types of curtsies in the era. Now, there were some standardized ones that we can find in dance manuals, and we're going to be talking about those too in this video. So now that I've said we're going to talk about all of that stuff, let's actually talk about it. Welcome to Curtsying with Ellie, where we will be breaking down formal curtsying, modern curtsying, and bowing throughout the 1800s. As we already talked about, there was an evolution of the formal curtsy throughout the 1800s. Now, there are a few points in time that we have sort of a snapshot of what it probably looked like. But just for a good starting reference point, let's talk about what we generally know today as a curtsy. I go over it in my video on how to meet Queen Victoria and be a debutante in Queen Victoria's royal court. But it's the basic movement where your weight is supported on your front leg and either leg can be your front or back leg, whatever you're most comfortable with. And then your back leg goes back and it's on a point and you go down, right? There's like a, a dipping motion happening with your legs and your head. In modern curtsying, your arms can just be down to your side. If you're wearing a really big skirt that needs pulled out, you can pull it out. Either is acceptable. But what's important about this modern curtsy is the fact that the weight is being supported on our front leg. So for example, when I'm in this position where my front leg is flat and my back leg is pointed, my weight is all on my front leg. Look, I can pick up my back leg and I am fine. This is important because where the weight is at is one of the major things that defines the curtsies throughout the 1800s. So first, let's go to some of the earliest curtsies I could find information about in the early 1800s. And this is information from the dance historian Elizabeth Aldrich. According to her, the weight is on the back leg in this generation. So for example, we would start with our feet turned out in a V formation, and we would step forward and point one of them. We would just sort of point whatever foot we want in front. Our weight is being supported on our back leg. We gently pinch our skirt between our fingers and sort of pull it out. And we incline as our back leg knee bends. So it's like we bend and this is the basic motion. So again, we would put the front leg out in a pointed fashion and we'd bend the back leg while we're also bending sort of like at our waist and our head sort of like dipping forward in this curtsying. And then when we're done, we would just bring our, our leg back, right? Just, and we're back to this position. Now, this is one form of curtsy that was recorded in the early 1800s. However, I would say the more robustly documented curtsy is this next one that we're about to do. And this is well documented throughout the 1800s. This is very much what a formal dance teacher would have their students learn how to do. So you would start with your legs in a V formation, and then whichever leg will be your back leg, will come out and then back. And it's gonna be pointed when it does that. So like out, back, and see it's in a point. Or according to some dance manuals, you can try to do that all in one, just like sweeping motion, right? You don't have to go boom, boom. You can just go boom. There's so many sound effects in this. Now your leg needs to go far enough back that if you were to rock back and forth like this, your hips would stay pretty neutral. They're not making any sort of crazy movement. So for example, if your leg is not far enough back and you try to do this, 
your hips end up doing this weird rocking movement, right? If you rock back and forth. We don't want that. That's just a side note on how far back your leg needs to be though. So out and then back. Now, this is the important weight shifting point. What we're gonna do is we're gonna shift our weight from our front foot to our back foot. We're pretty much gonna sink down on our back foot and then let our front foot raise up into a point. So at first, our back foot is pointed and then we roll back on it and then our front foot is pointed, right? So we're going from point to point. At this moment, our weight now needs to be on our back leg. So while we're doing that though, as our weight is going onto our back leg, that's also when our body sort of bends in and sinks into this curtsy really. So again, have our dainty fingers. So as we sink back, our body goes down in, like it bends at the waist and the hips pretty much. Let's see if I do it from here. It's like, it goes like this, but something else really interesting is the legs. Because we started in a V and we ended in a V, our legs, when they go out, they go into this plie shape. It's essentially a really deep plie that's happening here. And just a warning, I tried to do this in so many different skirts and dresses and it's really hard because as deep as this plie goes, even this dress, like I have to lift it up to be able to get my legs out that far. Otherwise it's gonna like split the seams on the dress. So it's out back. And then as we shift the legs plie out, our body leans forward. <laughs> and then after this point where we're down, we then go back up with this foot pointed and then together. <laughs> okay, again from the top we have out, back. When we sink down, our legs plie out. Then when we come back up, our front foot points. So at this moment, our weight is still all on our back leg. So the final movement of this thing is to shift our weight back to the front foot and bring our foot closed. So what's really interesting about this curtsy in particular is it could go really, really low when your legs plie out, or you could sort of like barely do it. Your feet can be super, super pointed, or they can be mildly pointed. So for example, that could be the curtsy, or this could be the curtsy, right? They could be either super intense or more realistic, I would say. I was actually able to find kind of the equivalent to really low quality film footage of this motion. The scientist was interested in studying animal movements and he took a lot of burst photography images of women doing different types of curtsies and bows. I think I found like at least three examples of this. Also in this footage, you can see this is the type of curtsy she's doing. She's doing a very gentle and refined version of it. And I really, really like how it looks when she does it versus some of the illustrations I find in dance manuals that just honestly look kind of funny. <laughs> so I would say this is the most documented formal curtsy I could find from the era. And I feel like it really is defined by the fact that your weight starts on the front, it goes to the back, and then it comes back to the front. It gives the body this really interesting movement pattern. Now, just so you know, this movement was notorious for being super unnatural and looking ugly if you don't do it well, and yet they still did it. However, by the late 1800s, we were also seeing pretty much what we know today as that modern curtsy, where the weight starts on the front and it stays on the front and the back leg just points and you go down. And of course, if you were meeting the queen, you would go far, far down. Now, for example, we get a lot of references to something called the Bob curtsy in the 1800s. And really to me, the only thing that really makes sense with a Bob curtsy is that modern curtsy because it does create that effect of like bobbing up and down if you do it very quickly. And as I already said, by the late 1800s, curtsying of any of these types 
was very much out of fashion with the upper classes. What they were all about was bowing. So let's talk about bowing now. So a lady's bow in the 1800s could be similar to a man's bow where her legs remain, <laughs> where her legs remain straight and she bows from the center and comes back up. That was possible, that was acceptable. However, from a lot of the documentation I've seen, a lot of ladies' bows still involved the leg bend in them. And I feel like this is something we do see in a lot of historical dramas where you have sort of this gentle leg bend happening while bowing. So this is a bow. Now, with this motion, you might be like, well, how is that different from curtsying? And from analyzing this for hours, I think one of the main differences is the location of the legs. Because the upper body movement is very, very similar in a curtsy versus a bow, right? From here up, it looks very similar. The difference is where the legs are at. It seems with a lot of bowing, the legs either stay together or they stay very close together. So that when they bend, they're bending together where in a curtsy, your legs are bending in multiple different directions, right? So for example, from the side, my legs are bending together. And even if I slightly have one of my feet up, they're still basically bending together. Where in a curtsy and I bend, see my legs bending out this way, and my other one's bending out that way. And I would say that's one of the defining factors between a lady's bowner. Her curtsy is where those legs are going. Depending on how intense this curtsy was and how far back this leg's really going, you can see how they start merging into one, where a very slight curtsy might look like just a very intense bow. But I would say that even in the 1800s, there seemed to be a confusion or an overlap in how the terms got used for this very just sort of like low key bow curtsy hybrid thing happening. What's really interesting, for example, in 1995 Prime Prejudice is we see Elizabeth both curtsy and bow. There's definitely times where her leg is back and she's doing this. And there's also times where I don't even know if there's much of a leg bend going on and she's doing this. So I'm gonna be doing a whole other video on when you would use the bows and the curtsies in different social situations. However, one situation you would definitely use them in is saying hello to people on the street. And the reason we're talking about that here is because it's actually a specific movement that is pretty much like the street curtsy slash bow. So imagine that you are Catherine Moreland walking in Bath and you see your acquaintance. You need to say hi to them, but perhaps they're not the sort of acquaintance that you wanna stop and talk to, but you need to acknowledge their existence, right? Well, you would engage something called the passing salute or basically the walking bow curtsy thing. Basically, you would walk and you would pause with your foot forward of whichever side the person you are greeting is on. If they're on your right side, your right foot would be the one you pause with it forward, or if they're on your left side, you would pause with your left foot forward. Anyway, you walk, you pause, you do the inclination movements, and you keep walking. And this, my friends, is the passing bow. But yeah, you walk, you pause, you bow, and you keep walking. And you can really see how much faster this is than having to stop, do this, and then keep going. But basically it was a form of quick reading that also allowed you to keep walking if you did not wanna stop and talk to someone. Of course, if you wanted to stop and talk to someone, you would still use the passing salute because it's the proper thing to do while walking, but then you would also just stop walking and talk to them. <laughs> So now that we've covered all of that, let's go back to this question of what would Elizabeth Bennett's bow have actually been like? Would she have bowed? Would she have curtsied? And I think it really does come down to, we don't know, but I do have to say after all the hours of research on this topic, I think they do a pretty good job depicting realistically what she would have done in adaptations like 1995-2005 and you know, really all of the period dramas. I feel like that's as 
close to accurate as anyone can get and it is very representative. I think the very extreme formal bow where they're like plieing out their legs a lot would have been something done probably well at dances, maybe meeting nobility. But basically from what I tell, their everyday curtsying and bowing was a lot more gentle and smaller than what a lot of dance teachers were teaching at the time. So let me know in the comments down below, which of these bows and curtsies would you want to do? Do you think you would have been a slight curtsier, a formal bower? Would you be someone who really pleated out their legs and got some lower body workout? Let me know in the comments down below and keep having an awesome day because you're awesome. Bye.